Uh, let us turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 20. Uh, this is where we were. Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were open. The great white throne of judgment. Who is the judge? The Lord Jesus Christ. And who are standing before him? The dead of all the ages. Verse 12 tells us, and I saw the dead. So the first question I want you to think about is, will we be there? Standing before God on that day. When we read the word of God and understand it and apply it in our lives, we must be careful to understand the words with the meaning that scripture assigns those words, not how in the world people use those words. Okay, uh, so uh, you can keep your hand over here and turn for a moment to James chapter 2 and verse 26. James chapter 2, verse 26 says, the body without the spirit is dead. That is the biblical definition of a dead person. Okay. The body is mortal. Our spirit soul, immortal, cannot die. Okay. So, when a person is described as dead, it basically means that his spirit and soul are separate. That's a dead person. A living person has his spirit soul indwelling his body. When the spirit soul leaves the body, the person is called dead. Of course, the spirit soul is conscious, alive. It has not ceased to exist, nor has it ceased to be conscious. But it is no longer in the body. That is what dead means. If you remember, <clears throat> we have talked <clears throat> about what will happen to us when the Lord Jesus returns for his church. The dead in Christ will rise first. Okay? They were dead, but now they will no longer be dead. They will be resurrected. We who are alive at his coming, together with them, will be transformed. And then we will be with the Lord forever. We will not stand before him at the great white throne of judgment because we will no longer be among the dead. In fact, the righteous of all ages. Righteous, however, does not mean sinless. But having the righteousness of Christ imputed to them, their sins having been forgiven, the righteous of all ages, meaning the forgiven of all the ages, will already have received their resurrection and they will no longer be dead. The only dead will be the wicked dead, meaning the unforgiven dead, meaning those 
who were offered forgiveness but refused to accept it for some reason or the other. Okay? So, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Judgment is always based on actions. And our actions condemn us because they always fall short of the glory of God. But there was another book that was opened. The judgment was on the basis of their actions. But something else will happen on the basis of the other book, the book of life. We go down uh, to the yeah, verse 13. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. People are judged on the basis of their actions, but Whether they will spend eternity with God or spend eternity in the lake of fire depends on whether their names are recorded in the book of life or not. The book of life is a registry of all people who possess eternal life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only those who have not been forgiven, who have not received the salvation of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, will not have their names in the book of life and will be thrown into the lake of fire to be forever banished from the presence of God. Chapter 21. Uh, you will notice in a lot of what we studied in the book of Revelation, we do not have a role to play. Chapter 21, we are back there in the picture. Okay? So, let us see. Then I saw a new heaven. What is this then? After the great white throne of judgment. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Why was there the need for a new heaven and a new earth? For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. They had dissolved out of existence. They did not exist anymore. Then I saw a great white throne, chapter 20 again, verse 11, and him who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence. They ceased to exist. If where is his presence? Everywhere, isn't it? So if something flees from his presence, it is no longer in existence. So God creates a new heaven and a new earth. Now there are some who will say, that actually what God is doing is renewing, renovating the existing heaven and earth. Okay. My position is there is a renovation of the present heaven and earth 
which takes place at the beginning of the millennium. As the millennium comes to an end, there is a great rebellion. And then, even as God sets up his great white throne, even this renovated heaven and earth is to exist. Okay, uh, turn with me for a moment to uh, Isaiah. Isaiah, the last chapter of Isaiah. last chapter of Isaiah, uh, where it talks about, if you look at verse 20, hmm, uh, they will bring all your brothers, the Jews, hmm, from all the nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord on horses and chariots and wagons and on mules and camels, says the Lord. The scattered Jews will be brought back to their homeland. They will bring them as the Israelites bring their grain offerings to the temple of the Lord in ceremonially clean vessels. And I will select some of them also to be priests and Levites, says the Lord. As the new heavens and new earth that I make will endure before me. Okay. So very often this expression is taken to mean a renovation. Okay. It is the new heavens and the new earth that will endure before the Lord. The new heaven and the new earth that we read about in Revelation chapter 21, they will endure before the Lord. But we are told that the present universe has been kept reserved for judgment, destruction. Okay? So, <clears throat> as the new heavens and new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. From one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will bow down before me, says the Lord, and they will go out and look upon the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. Their worm will not die, nor will their fire be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind. This is a picture of the millennium. In the millennium, the humanity will, that is present on earth will have many privileges. One is Satan will have been bound. Second is the Lord Jesus himself will be physically present on earth. Thirdly, they will be able to go out and look at the dead bodies of people who had rebelled against God. Okay? They will have this privilege to deter them from sin. However, the sin nature is still there. And unless they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and are born again, when Satan is released at the end of thousand years, they will be misled by him and join with him in that final rebellion against God and will be destroyed. Then the new heaven and new earth God creates for the past heaven and past earth will have been destroyed and will cease to exist. 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. In the new heaven and new earth, there will be no sea. We are not told why. We are simply told that this is so. Hmm? A possible reason, okay, a possible reason is found in Isaiah chapter 57, verses 20 and 21, where we read that the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my Lord, for the wicked. So there is a resemblance between wicked humanity and the sea. The sea is always restless, tossing about. It is always foaming, and all the filth that is within is churned and brought out. And you only have to go to the beach and to see how much filth the sea throws out. Regularly. The wicked resemble the sea. So, I believe there is nothing in the new heaven and new earth which will even remind people of wickedness and wicked people. All memory of wicked people, wickedness will have been blotted. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Before we reflect on this, there is something perhaps we can turn our attention to, and that is in uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Reading from verse 18. The Apostle Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Okay. So at present, we are often humiliated in this world. And we experience a lot of suffering. But all this is not to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us in the future. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. The Bible tells us all creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration. When did this happen? When man sinned. That's what we read about in Genesis chapter 3. God cursed the earth, said thorns and thistles it will bear. Then for man, no longer could he just pluck and eat. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. And then, from that one man's sin, death had become a part of the experience of not only human beings, but of all the living. 
So creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Who is the one who subjected it to all this? God. Because of, by his will it happened. In the hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. Okay, so there is something very interesting that is a feature of the present universe. Okay. It is called the second law of thermodynamics. Like we have the law of gravity, now we have the second law of thermodynamics. One of the consequences of the second law of thermodynamics is that everything in the universe will run down. Water flows down from higher level to lower level. Okay. What is ordered becomes chaotic and disordered. What is living dies. Okay. What is dead decays. So, in all of the universe, this second law of thermodynamics is a description of how the universe is subject to death and decay. It is a universal law. Which is why evolution cannot be true. What is ordered breaks down in nature. Disorder never becomes order because universe has been subject to bond, is subject to decay. So evolution is never possible. The bondage to decay brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. All of nature is seen as groaning in pain to bring into existence the new heaven and new earth. Not only so, but we ourselves also who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Our spirits, our souls are redeemed. When we put our faith in our Lord's sacrifice on the cross, our bodies are redeemed at our resurrection, which will happen when the Lord returns. But the full glory of what we will be in the new heaven and new earth will be revealed only then. Okay? The Bible tells us all of nature is waiting for that glory in us to be revealed. Hmm? So, if we turn to 1 John chapter 3, there is a tip. Verse 1, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Okay. There is a future experience awaiting us. The full revelation of which 
is for the future. Okay, so let's get back to Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men. And he will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Now this new Jerusalem, the holy city, combines with it elements of the Garden of Eden, the city of Jerusalem, the Holy of Holies in the temple, and many more beautiful and excellent aspects of the life of God's people. When God created man, he placed him in a beautiful garden. In that garden, he experienced the presence of God. Then man sinned and was expelled from God's presence, expelled from that beautiful garden that God had placed him in. Then God asked him to construct a temple where he will meet with man. The temple was the house of God on earth. In the temple, God resided in the Holy of Holies, which was cubical. Its length and width and height were identical, cube. Accordingly, the New Jerusalem is also cubical. It contains elements of Eden and the Holy of Holies and the declaration that God will live among his people. Verse 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. So the final destiny of redeemed man is in the presence of God, in the Holy of Holies of the universe. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. What? Tears in heaven? What tears are these? I believe when I see what God has created for me, what eye has not seen, what ear has not heard, what the mind of man has not been able to imagine, what God has created for me and brings me into it, me, wretched sinner that I was, he brings me into this amazing privilege and 
in order to make it possible for a wretched sinner like me to experience all this glory, he sent his son to bear my sin and my punishment. And at such great pain and cost, purchased me so that I could be in his presence forever. When I See all that. Will I not be moved to tears? When I think that this God, this great and awesome God, who so graciously has dealt with me, when I think of the way I have treated him. Not only before I heard of him, but even after I have come to faith in him and have been saved, often my heart and my feet have strayed. But he did not give up on me. He continued to draw me close to him, lavishing on me his love over and over and over again. When I will I not be moved? To tears. Yes, there will be tears in him. But God will wipe away those tears. Verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. Or mourning. Or crying. Or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. What old order? What we read about in Romans chapter 8. We were part of that universe. Subject to bondage and decay. So, sickness and pain. Shame and sorrow were part of our life. We struggle. But now the old order of things has passed away. There will be no more sickness. No more sorrow. No more death. No more mourning. I know there are people who say that from the moment you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sickness has no place in your life because by his stripes we have been healed. But no, that is not what scripture teaches us. It is only in the new heaven and new earth that we will no longer experience Sickness, pain, death, sorrow. Everything will be taken away. Till then, these will be part of our life. But even in sickness and pain, we can always approach God, commit ourselves to Him, if it is the Lord's will, he will heal us. If it is not the Lord's will to heal us, still his grace is sufficient for us to go through whatever sickness and pain that the Lord is allowing us to experience in this life. Sickness, pain, death, sorrow, 
will be taken away only in the new heaven and new earth. Verse 5, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He was our source. And now, he is our end. We do not become one with him. God is God. We are his creation. But we will be with him. United in never ending fellowship with him forever. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To whom he is, to him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this. If you remember, when we were reading and reflecting on Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the seven letters written to the seven churches, each of them, how did they end? To him who overcomes. All of God's blessings are for the overcomer. We overcome through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our overcoming proves that our faith is genuine. He who overcomes will inherit all this. I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the wild, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second thing. The overcomer will inherit all this. But the coward, the unbelieving. And all those who practice everything that is evil, not able to, not willing to overcome, their place is in the lake of fire. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. I have deliberately avoided a PowerPoint. How do you show in PowerPoint what the eye has not seen, what the ear has not heard, what the human mind has not been able to conceive? Huh? So, there is a description given, but we will also remember it is a vision. In a vision, there is much that is 
symbolic. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, which tells us <coughs> that in the holy city will be found the redeemed of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Is not the church of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the 12 apostles, which tells us that the true church will be here. So then the new Jerusalem is the redeemed of all ages. They have become the dwelling place of God. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, as wide and high as it is long, cubical. Sizes humongous. 12,000 stadia is 2,200 kilometers. 2,200 kilometers is almost the exact by road distance from New Delhi to Chennai. That will be the length, the breadth, and the height of the New Jerusalem. Okay, cubic. You will notice you might have read about it in the news that Saudi Arabia is building a cubical city. So some of the Muslims are upset that it is an imitation of the Kaaba. Oh, it is a mockery of the new heaven and new earth. Saudi Arabia is trying to create a new heaven and new earth. They say, with the help of money, we can do it, man. The new heaven and new earth will be cubical. I mean, the new Jerusalem will be cubic. The dwelling place of God. He measured its wall, and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the man, which the angel was using about 65 meters or 200 feet. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl, and the great street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. How much of this is going to be actual? How much of it is symbolic? Perhaps it might not be easy for you and me to figure out. But there are some things which we can learn. Gold. Here on earth. 
people make crowns and place it on their heads. They make ornaments and wear it. In the new Jerusalem, we will walk on it, for the streets will be made of gold. Perhaps this tells us what is precious in the eye of man is often of either no consequence or even despicable and contemptible in the eye of God. What we place on the head will be trampled on in heaven. Another observation is you will notice everything is transparent for there is nothing to hide. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. They are present there. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light. What will not be there? No sea, no sun, no moon. The Lamb is its Lamb. The nations will walk by its and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates be ever shut. City gates were shut at sunset. No sun, no sunset. So the city gates will never be shut. For there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. <coughs> Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. <coughs> but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So, the city then represents on the one hand, the redeemed of all the ages. <coughs> on the other hand, the city which will be their dwelling place and also the dwelling place of God. God willing, we will continue next week. <coughs>